I'll start with saying this. The typical classroom scenario or the traditional model basically, and, I, and I, I prob probably oversimplifying this, but I think you'll, you'll capture the main concept that I'm trying to get across here. Traditionally, people tend to think of schools as a situation where you have 20 some odd kids in a classroom and the teacher's up front explains a few things to the kids, introduces some information, they do a little bit of practicing, and they tell the kids, do some homework, study it on your own, and come back. And they, they teach the content throughout the year on a very strict schedule. And every so often, there's a test that's issued, and that test gets entered for a grade in the grade book. At the end of the grading period, they get a grade. And at the end of four grading periods, they average those out, and you get an annual grade. Okay, that's a system you know. Now that's not necessarily a, a, a bad system, it's just a system that doesn't reach everybody. I would say, and based on the data that we have from the first, years of op first four years of operation, is that that works for maybe 60 to 70% of the kids. The 60 to 70% of students that would have been good anyway. So what we're gonna do next year is, first of all, um, if I could sum it up in one phrase, it would be, the student is the class. And that's not my saying, I think that's a Licky saying, right? Um, that is Licky. Fischler. Fischler, I'm sorry. Yeah. Abraham Fischler being the founder of Nova Southeastern University. Um, he lives here in South Florida. He's also the former chair of the Broward County School Board. And think of what that means. The student is the class. When a teacher tests the class, everybody tests on the same day, and 70 or 75 percent of the kids pass the test reasonably, and I call that the proximity level, the teacher moves on to the next thing. And if a student didn't get that information, or if the, if the student is in that area of the 20 or 30 percent of kids that didn't understand or didn't quite pass the test, they have to move on anyway. Now, for a long time I've thought about how do we address this problem, because I really don't think that this is the best way to teach. But because we're a public charter school and we have to follow certain state requirements, We've come up with a hybrid to address that. I'll tell you one problem in particular that in high school is a very serious problem. When you follow the student progression plan, which we do, it means that anytime you pass a class, you cannot take that course again. And you automatically move to the next level. So let's take mathematics for an example. If you get a D in algebra one for your final grade in ninth grade, you move on to geometry. A D is hardly a good grade for anybody to go anywhere in, right? And so here comes 10th grade and that student is still struggling. And by the third year, they may be lost altogether or perhaps missing a credit. Now this is not everybody. We realize that many of our students are good mathematicians, but this same situation might be happening in other areas. It could be language arts, it could be science. And the problem with this is that there's no real teaching for understanding going on. There's no real teaching for mastery. Students, a large amount of students, are just moving through. And so what we say with that system is that because we have to cover all of the material, because we have this checklist of benchmarks and objectives that the state says we have to do, we move kids on. And the time is constant. Okay, Everything is on a time schedule. First grading period, we're going to do this. Second grading period, we're going to do that. Third grading period, we're going to do this list of stuff. And then the last grading period. What happens with that is that for the students who can handle that, they do fine. But the ones that can't, the learning becomes variable. Some kids are gonna have A's, some kids are gonna have B's, some have D's, some have C's, some have F. And the ones that are at the bottom of that, it's really difficult for them over time as the material gets more and more difficult. And again, if you're a school like us that's trying to get everybody into these AP courses and trigonometry and calculus and these courses that we know are going to make them competitive for, for college acceptance, as the material gets more and more difficult when they get older, unless we teach the skills for them to become better learners, they're not going to get better. Their GPAs are actually going to come down. They have to keep up with that pace. So now what we're going to do is we're going to implement a time variable model, which means that students are going to be able to work at their own pace. It doesn't mean that they're going to have an unlimited amount of time. What it means is that they're going to be able to manipulate the time with the cooperation of the teacher to serve their needs. Okay? One good example I could give you if you can think of this picture. Picture yourself in a situation where you're trying to go from one city to another in your car. Okay, and you're told that you have to go 
50 miles an hour to get there. And you can never slow down and you can never speed up. So when you reach a sharp curve, you have to take that curve at 50 miles an hour. And when you're on a straightaway where you can make up for some time and you have no curves, you can't go any faster than 50 miles an hour. Now pick, put, picture that in a school setting. When students are put in a strict timeline, okay, those that can go faster tend not to be able to do so because the teacher has to wait for certain kids in the class to catch up because a good teacher is going to try to keep as many kids on board as possible. That's expected. And we call that the proximity, the herd. Okay. Now, if a student is a struggling student in that class, it doesn't help that student because the class is going to go too fast for him or her no matter what. So the only ones that are going to really benefit from this are the ones in the middle. And that's not a really thorough approach. So because time is constant and the learning is variable, we have mixed results as we move from year to year and the material gets harder. The kids who have always been good are doing well and the ones that have always been bad are doing poorly. So how do we fix this? We have to change it to a situation where the same way that the class moves forward when there is overall success, 70%, 75%, that's fine. But now the student is the class. And the only way you can do that is if each student is working individually one by one. So if a student is very, very capable in mathematics, they can just move right on ahead. If a student is struggling, they can slow down to their pace. Now your teachers have been here for a week and I've been researching this model for two years with a lot of emphasis being placed on it over the last two to three months. In a nutshell, here's how your grading is gonna work this year. If you're a student who is working during the first grading period, for example, let's use math. Math is a good example, but this is gonna to apply to all of your classes. There is a certain amount of information that has to be covered in the first grading period. Okay, we know that. If you're a very capable student and you're working at your own pace, you're going to be able to exceed those. You're going to move on as quickly as you want. And the teachers over time are now being trained to be able to manage that. Okay? Teachers won't be, they can be on occasion, but by and large they won't be lecturing at the front of the class and then just giving you a test at the end of it all. That's not the way that this is going to work. What's going to happen is that before you can go to the next thing, you have to master the thing that you're on. So if you're a little bit slower in math, the class does not move ahead because you are the class. The student is the class. And so while we can have some students that, are, that have mastered maybe 15 major objectives in the first grading period, there might be another student who's maybe major, has only mastered 10, and that's okay. They will both have an A at that point in the class. Because in this model, learning is the constant, and what we're going to vary is time. But of course, to do that, we have to do it on a one-by-one -one basis. So eventually computers will be a big part of this and technology, but it need not only be that way. It can be throughout many different types of monitoring. Students can be grouped. First of all, you all know all high school students have been placed in honors courses and AP courses next year. There's no such thing as a regular student. You should all be outstanding students. And in middle school, everybody's going to advance. So in a, class when the, in, a, in, a, in a classroom situation where every student is the class, it doesn't matter what you call the course that he's in because everybody's going to be expected to excel and to exceed expectations. Now, this doesn't mean that you have an unlimited amount of time. What we want to do is make sure that students don't ever put themselves in a situation or that we don't allow them to be in a situation that by 11th grade, they're taking courses that are just over their heads because they were weak to begin with. Now, if you, I want you to visualize something. Some of this, even for teachers, this is difficult to understand. So I would imagine for a parent who's not really in education, um, this might be a little bit of a, of a concept to, to absorb at first. But consider a situation where a student only masters half the year and they're getting an F and they're failing that class. There are two ways that you can cut, some, cut something. You can cut something vertically, or you can cut something horizontally. Now, when a student takes a course, and all throughout that course, they're moved on a timeline, 
and they're mostly getting C's, we're cutting the half part that they never got, that 50% that they didn't understand is being divided like this. What does this mean? That they went through all the material, but they never learned any of the material really in depth. And that's a double, that's a double problem because not only did they not get through the material, there's also not enough foundational learning there for future learning. Meaning when that student goes to the next level class because he got a C or a D, there's a significant part of mastery that they don't have. And that next teacher is gonna have to go back and try to work with that student's skills that they didn't get way back from the first day of school in the previous course from last school year. So we're dividing it like this. Another way that a student can have their learning divided is like this. In a case where a student works slower, this is the right way to do it. In this model, students are gonna be told that they have the ability to decide how they wanna learn, at what pace they wanna learn, but we're also gonna emphasize on time management skills because we as adults and as the teachers in the room are gonna help them monitor. So what does this mean? If a student gets halfway through the first grading period, they're gonna have an A in the class by that point because they will not have been able to get to the sixth or seventh thing that they had to master unless each one of those was mastered with at least a, a level of a B, an 80%. So at that point, they will have an A. When the end of the grading period comes in, we are going to apply something which is called the completion differential. You're going to say, well, what does that mean? Well, if they were supposed to have 15 grades and they only were able to master seven of those, the ones that they did not do are going to be entered as zeros because they ran out of time. But don't let that alarm you. What's going to happen is that, first of all, we know that that first half that they learned is actually solidly learned, okay? When they go into the next grading period, that next grading period, they will work on the things from the first grading period that they didn't get. At the middle school level, that will be done through a second period of mathematics and a seventh period of language arts. And at the high school level, staff will come in to help. You guys are a little bit older and we expect that you can catch up a little more autonomously. But the goal is, to not move somebody onto something before they've mastered what they have. Now let's say that we're in the second grading period now, you're into two weeks of the second grading period. And after those two or three weeks, you were able to complete those things that you didn't master in your first grading period. Your teachers will then, you're gonna test on your own schedule because you're working on a one by one basis, not always a written test. There are gonna be many different ways that you can demonstrate to the teacher that you've mastered that competency. And then we go back and we're gonna change the grade for the first grading period. Okay, what that means, what that tells a student is like, hey, you know what? You can do it, you can get A's and B's, it just takes you a little longer sometimes. And for the student who's really bright and gifted in that subject, you can say, hey, you can do more, why aren't you doing it? Go on ahead and do it. So what we're trying to do is maximize each student's potential. And we don't wanna put them in a situation, as long as they're being responsible, and as long as they're, they're demonstrating to the, to the teacher that they really are giving it their all, if in the second grading period, they master those, those last few things that they didn't get in the first grading period, we're gonna go back and change the grade. Now, of course, they're gonna be a little bit further behind for the second grading period, of which we'll do the same thing during the third grading period. But what I'm saying is that let's cycle this through all the way now to the last grading period of the school year. Students get C's and D's as a final grade every day as we are now in our existing model. So now put yourself as a high school student in a situation where you went through the entire school year and you still were not able to do everything, but you solidly mastered everything that was required in the first grading period, everything that was required in the second, everything that was required in the third, and almost everything of the fourth. Your first three grades will probably be an A or a B, which helps your GPA, and your fourth grading period would probably be a little lower because at the end of the year, you're out of time. You can do no more makeup. There is no more changing of a grade. However, you will have had four grading periods to learn management skills, time management skills. And as each grading period goes on, you're going to realize what level you need to work on 
for mastery so that you don't fall behind. When you average the three A's and the slightly lower grade in the fourth grading period, overall, your course grade for that year in that class is gonna be much higher. And then what we've done is we've narrowed down for students who typically struggle in a class, the little bit that they may not understand is just the end part of the curriculum for that year, which we could try to address through some type of special intervention, a second class, tutoring after school, maybe um, summer programs that we can instill in the problem. But now, rather than having a student go back and relearn all the stuff that they were getting seasoned since the beginning of the year, we don't have to worry about that. We're just going to focus on that little bit that they didn't get at the end of last year. So when they come in the following year, that teacher is going to get them a heck of a lot closer to the level they need to be rather than the other way where they don't have any really foundation and by 11th grade they're struggling with AP. So parents, what you need to understand with this grading system is as follows. You may go in to the grade book in Pinnacle and see that five weeks into any given grading period, your child has a B. And that's always going to be that way. Expect it. Because what we're trying to tell you is that on the five or six or seven competencies that they've done, they can't help but to get an A or a B because we're not going to let them move on to anything else until they've mastered it with an A or a B. Because this system is based on teaching for understanding and mastery. So if you only allow students to move on when they get an A, the grade is always going to be an A. What's going to vary is the fact that some students are going to be able to do that with five masteries, and some students are going to do it with ten masteries. But because we're a public school, we can't just wave and let anybody go with an unlimited amount of time because we do have to follow state standards. So at the end of the first grading period, it is possible that if they've only done half the material, they have a D or an F. Don't panic. Because what that's going to do now is it's going to tell the student, well, guess what? You got a D as of now, but the year is not over yet. Remember, at the end of the school year, what they get is an annual grade. They don't get a nine-week grade. The colleges are going to see an A as the final grade in math, for example. That's what the GPA is based on. So if a student is behind six weeks and they want to come back and work harder during the next grading period, we should not punish them for that. We should actually encourage them to do that because what happens with certain kids is if they see they got a D or a C in a class of first grading period and a C or a D in the second grading period, then they give up. They just give up. And then what they have is a, a lesser, you know, a bad attitude for the rest of the year because they think, well, no matter how good I do, I did so bad in the past that now the best I can get is a C, so I'm just not going to try. So we want you guys, students in here, to understand that it's about mastery. This is the way that a musician learns. You know, I, I see Mr. Uh, Mason here in the audience, and he knows, I'm sure, what, what, what I'm talking about. You know, in music and any of the arts, we all have different talent levels. And there are prodigies, you know, very much like Jacob, who can do stuff at a very early age, and that's great, and they should be encouraged to move on and do more. And other students on the piano, it may take them to do one year what another kid can do in six months, and that's okay. That's fine within reason, within one year's time. What I'm saying is that we're taking the straitjacket off of the teachers, the Day County Schools Basing Guides. We're gonna remove that. And if you can go faster, we're gonna let you go faster. And if you need help and go a little slower to work on mastery, we're gonna let you do that as well. And we're going to help you identify the fact that people have different achievement levels, but we have to cut it off somewhere and it's gonna be logically at the annual point. Because by the end of the school year, we have to issue a final grade. Under this system, everybody's GPA is going to go up. Because you're going to have the ability to go back and master things that you couldn't do in the first grading period or the second or the third. When you get to the fourth grading period, if you're still behind, well then at that point you know that if you step it up, you might be able to pull off a B. And now your whole grade is going to get average for the year. And guess what? It's going to be an accurate grade because you're not going to move to the next thing unless you mastered what you, you're on. And you're going to learn very, very clearly that if you don't work for understanding and if you don't reach for mastery, you're not going to be able to move on. Now, there are going to be some cases where kids go so slow or they can't get the mastery that they fall really far behind and they'll have just two A's and be missing 20 assignments. 
Our expectation is that through guys like Mr. McRae on staff, myself, our staff, our counselor, will have interventions. And before they get to fall behind 10 grades, 15 grades, that student will have been spoken to and we will have an alternative in there for them so that they don't ever fall that far behind to begin with. But what we want is a lot more thorough approach. It is more important to learn three things right than 10 things halfway. And that's how it is in music and that's how it is in the arts in general. You would never think of going to the second etude in a music book that's harder than the one that you're working on just because you're trying to get through the book. As artists, you guys all understand the importance of excellence. Excellence is more important than time. And if someone is, quote unquote, less talented than someone else, they can make up for it by just working harder. It's as simple as that. And you, in my music program, kids in my jazz class know I, I mention this all the time. John Coltrane was always a pretty good musician, but he didn't revolutionize the world until he was practicing well into his 40s, while Mozart was writing arias when he was, you know, six years old. Everybody's different. It doesn't mean that their art is less valid. What we have to do is we have to be able to manipulate time so that we maximize the product. The advanced, the brilliant can go on and move forward, and the ones that need help can get it and slow down a little bit. The ones in the middle can be challenged to become greater. We're, we're basically doing the same thing we've always done in the past. It is still a one year's amount of learning for one year's worth of school. But what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of this strict timeline, and we're going to improve our game by telling everybody, forget about this garbage about I'm, a, I'm in regular math, he's in honors math, oh, he's gifted, but I'm not. That's, that's, that type of variation in the curriculum is not good because it accepts mediocrity. It accepts mediocrity. Every student in the school is going to be put in a situation that if they want to succeed, all they have to do is work hard and we will be there providing that support. And if they run out of a little bit of time at the end of the school year, that's a small problem to deal with. As opposed to having all these kids across the board getting C's throughout the year. And it's not that we have all that many of them, about 80% of our kids are not in that category. But any one of us can always improve, we know that. So the teacher's concerns, and the reason I'm talking about this so much is that they're saying, look, we just want to make sure, because the teachers are on board with this, and I think as you hear this, I would imagine, that especially if you're a student, the opportunity to always have a second chance and come back in there and work on stuff, I'm sure it's got to sound very appealing to you, okay? But the teachers are saying, well, but just remember, if you have 20 assignments in a grade book and a student has half of them done and they're 10 A's, the, te the, the, the parent is going to be accustomed to going to the grade book and seeing A's. Now the end of the grading period comes and we apply the 10 missing grades. We apply the completion differential and the grade comes down. Yes, that's true. It is true. They're going to go from an A and possibly to an F. They can come back and make that up. It's not etched in stone. And we have a system in place designed to maximize that happening. Okay, we can't compromise thoroughness and mastery just because we're trying to check stuff off of a list. Okay, and when you take students and just rush them through the curriculum, all over time, what happens is that, that the part that they don't get makes them weaker learners until then the course gets so difficult by junior and senior year, they're just bombing all together. So it's better to slow things down and let them vary the time. Sometimes they're gonna speed up because they're trying to catch up. Other times they're gonna slow down because they're not quite getting it. And as long as they know that they have the flexibility that the school will go in and change the grade, then it becomes less stressful and they can really focus on mastery. It only runs out at the end of the school year at the fourth grading period, by which time you will have had one year's notice to know how far behind they are. But I would rather have three A's and a D than to have four D's all year long. You get what we're trying to do here? Okay, so please support that, and if, you, and if it doesn't work or if there's some little problems with it, we'll fix it. But we realize that this is a radical thing that we're doing here, okay? And it's for your benefit. All right, guys? And be patient with us because, you know, the teachers are like, what? You're telling us everybody gets today? And I said, that's right, everybody's going to succeed in this school. What do you mean? 
It's taken me, I don't know how many hours talking, so be supportive of it. And they're going to be experimenting with us. You have a great, amazing group of teachers. Believe me when I tell you that they are open to anything that we ask them to do for your benefit. We are looking to change the culture of the school. They are your partners. Okay? They are not your punishers. They have been told every teacher has to partner with you. Your goals are their goals. You're not, they're not there to give you a checklist of what you can do and punish you with a bad grade at the end. They are going to be your mentors. You have got to take responsibility for your learning. If you fall behind, catch back up. If you're good at something, get better at it and count on them to help you. Okay? They're excellent, excellent people that do want to help you. This is going to be the year, folks, we make Mac number one. Remember, I'm telling you that. They have a couple thousand kids, and you look at the corresponding high school in that neighborhood, they'll have half that. Where do they go? They drop out. But the school system tells you that schools are improving all the time and all this stuff. And all they're doing is they put these so checklists the out there the and they push the kids. I mean, you understand, they allow you to go from one class in math to the next with a D. If you get a D for the year, they think that's good enough to get credit and move on. Would you ever accept that from your kid? I don't accept it from my daughter. No, but but the know, school system is like, well, we can't fail them all because then we retain them and it costs too much money. We can't do this. But you know what? I can at the charter school. I can do it. I can tell them, you're not going to move to the next thing until you've mastered it. I'm going to give you all year to do it, and I'm going to supplement the instruction, and we're going to put in interventions, and you're going to do the, the, the dead level best that you can do, and you're going to come up, if you come up short, you're going to come up a little bit short, or maybe even a chunk short, but you at least have something to build upon. And that's the strength of this. That's the power of this, that a kid is not wasting what he has done, because I'm telling you, I see the scores. I look at everybody's scores. Every, I print up a thing this thick every year and I look at how everybody did and I check and I see how they did you know it's just a printout out of the out of the uh, school systems mm -hmm. database and I highlight kids one by one every student I personally check every student and I make decisions that all these ideas they come they come from me sitting there and looking at that book this stuff doesn't come out of the sky so when I see that 80 to 75 percent of our kids are actually all getting A's and B's I'm thinking okay well that's good now what about this other 20 or 30 percent so I segregate those mm -hmm. And then I see, okay, who are these kids? Well, this kid is actually not that bad. He's almost there. He's just being lazy. So I put that kid in a different category, and I said, we need a program for this kind of kid. We need a structure to address the kid who's capable that just, just doesn't do it. Or and, the bad <clears throat> testers, the kids who, are, yeah. who cannot take yeah. uh, writing tests. Yeah. Who remember it, do it in class, get their homework, and, and, and then yeah. when it comes to the test, they just go blank. Yeah. yeah, and you know what that is? That's all about mechanics. Mm -hmm. you know, the homework yeah. has to be done yeah, in the yeah. class. It, um, right. The difference, that what connects exposition of new material to mastery, there's a bridge between those two things. Mm -hmm. There's a point when a student walks in the classroom and the teacher says, today we're learning this. However it is, whether it's a video, a DVD, teacher standing in front of the room, somehow the, t the student is told, here's something new to learn. And then they get tested. Now the test expects mastery. What connects those two things is not more of the first thing just talking over and over again. Mm -hmm. It's provide for practice. It's just like, this is a musician's approach to teaching academics. Every kid in my band knows what to do. They all know what to do. They just can't do it. Why? You need to practice. Some kids get good on the trumpet in six months, and other kids do it in two years. It doesn't mean they don't understand what they have to do. It's they need the cycle motor a bit. They got to do it. You got to get the brain needs repetition to mechanics. Mm -hmm. So what connects exposition of, of information, not what new knowledge, to mastering that knowledge is practice. I call it mechanics. That's the connecting bridge. Now, some kids, based on their ability, need a lot more mechanics than others. Mm. So therefore, you have to vary the time. You have to. Because that's what I would do as a musician. You know, I went to college. I had a guy named Jason Carter at my school. He was a brilliant genius. had been to Interlochen when he was 13 years old. had been wow. taking lessons all his life, and he was a very talented guy. I got there. I'd maybe been playing trumpet for three years. And I was like, oh, wow. And I felt this big. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, well, what has he done? He's just practiced a lot. He's had 10 years to do it. I'm going to have to practice more years, more time. I have to work twice as hard to make up for all the things that he's done that I haven't yet done. It's just common sense. So if you take both those kids and you put them in the same situation and you test them both the same, one's going to be high and one's going to be low. What? There's no mystery to that. That doesn't solve the problem. The solving of the problem is to take that kid who's lower and saying, okay, what do you need? What barrier can I remove so that you can catch up to this guy? You'll find that 95% of the kids will improve significantly. 
that five or three percent that won't respond is that's the kind of people that we have out there in society. But just you know, every society has people that don't function, but it shouldn't be forty percent of of our population. You know, schools are just like the societies. You know, forty percent of society is not failures. No, most people can function at a fairly high level, and, and, and they're decent, responsible people. So if you take that and you apply that to education, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to do it. What about work ethics? How do you teach a kid work ethics? And that's all part of it. It's mechanics again. Yeah. It's guided practice. Guided practice. <clears throat> With a program like this, and, and I think <clears throat> I think part of it is leading them. <clears throat> Rather than the, one thing I've learned with kids after this many years, as, as tempting as it is to do, and there are some teachers that I found really inclined because they just have those kinds of personalities, and we've all done it, just to different degrees. There are certain people, adults, that love to castigate, to chastise kids. Otherwise, how will they learn? Yeah, right. <laughs> they, they just don't like kids. And so when, when a kid has bad work habits, there are two ways you can address that. You can partner with them. Okay, in a way where you're trying to, you're, when you partner with them, you're trying to get inside their head. You're trying to figure out their thought process. You're trying to understand their attitudes. Mm -hmm. Not because of any other reason, the fact that you want to see how you can eliminate that barrier that's blocking them. So when you do that, now you can say, okay, if I could show them something that inspires them here, because I think this is what they're trying to get at. I know I was like that as a kid. If I didn't know the why about I was, uh, why I was doing something, I wouldn't do it. You, like, for example, Asian cultures. Asian cultures, the kids do what they're supposed to because they just are supposed to do it, and they do it. Right. That's the way it is in that culture. Our kids, it's not that they can't do it. It's that they want to know why. Because if it's not that interesting to me, if I already have any relevance to it, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to waste my time. They're just two different philosophies, two different attitudes. And so what we have to do is put kids, first of all, you have to make sure that the curriculum you're teaching really is relevant because they're absolutely right. If they're learning something that makes no sense and has no relevance to the real world, why is it even in the curriculum? Why are we teaching that? What is the validity of learning something for four years that you're never going to use and that's not relevant? So first of all, everything stand, it stems from high standards, curriculum, mastery of things that you can actually apply. Now, you have to accept that not all kids are going to see that value. Some of them will never see it. But the majority of them, with a good teacher, with a good mentor, or, or with a good support structure, if you put them in the right scenario, they can say, well, okay, what's relevant? And some things are going to be more relevant than others. We understand that. Like, as a trumpet player, I remember sitting in my college algebra class one and going, why the hell was I doing quadratic yeah. equations? I'm going to be a trumpet <laughs> player. I'm going to be a conductor. And I did it just because it was required. But I can certainly understand how a kid who wants to be a painter doesn't want to do quadratic equations. But then you have musicians like Ed Kai who are brilliant mathematicians, and they say, yeah, but I, I use it in my music in the sense that it helps. It, it's brain practice. You see it's, the patterns. It's like exercising my brain. Right. You know, um, when I exercise, it's not because I'm going to be an Olympic athlete. It's because I can walk better and feel better and wake up easier in the morning. So that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And, and you just have to get all the different kids to think that way. But one thing you can't do is... You can't have teachers that are constantly trying to punish kids for things. That, I've noticed, does not work. It doesn't mean you pander to them because Lord knows they, they know they don't want to walk into, into my office when they're in trouble. They're terrified. But I'm very selective as to how I use that. Moral stuff, like drugs, disrespect, I have absolute zero tolerance for that. We're working too hard to put up with that garbage. I've got no faith. But a kid who's having a hard time because he's immature or whatever, you know, you deal with that. Because I, I, I wasn't always a perfect student as a kid. So, you know what I mean? Um, so what I do is I told the teachers, is it really that big of a deal to you? I mean, what do you, what satisfaction do you get from seeing a kid in the third grading period who, who's now trying to make up for it, is trying to turn himself around, and comes back to you and says, can I go back and do something? No, no, no. Like, what are you, the church lady? What's, what's the point? <laughs> really? You're not going to let a 13-year-old who's trying to make a difference for himself yeah. and is trying to master this Let stuff? him redo the Because you've got some chip on your shoulder about how yeah. tough you are on standards. Just give me a break. And then, and, and, and yesterday when, a few, you know, of course, this, this stuff makes teachers anxious because you're, you're having them think outside of their own comfort zone. Mm -hmm. You know, and they weren't quite ready for this yesterday because they well, just we got we have to back. do a little more work because yeah. that means we have to do a yeah. test over again. Yeah. Oh, please. Yeah. But, but you know, when you I do it, tension. because I want to see. You could feel the tension in the faculty meeting yesterday because it's not that they didn't want to cooperate. It was just like they, they weren't able to understand it all. And this was such a new idea to them. And I said, you got, you're all acting as if you're going to have to do this by tomorrow. Your job performance is, uh, is going to be evaluated on this. 
and you don't feel you're ready to do this yet because it's just too new. So how's it feel? How's it feel to be tested on something you, that you just learned and you're not quite grasping and it's very high stakes as you think your job performance as a teacher and your ability to get a paycheck? How's it feel? And really then, you see how, Did you see how silent I got in that oh, room yeah. yesterday? But and, that's then I, what and then I told them, kids. and I said, 700 kids feel that every day when they walk in here and you do that. What you're feeling right now when your boss tells you, this is new information, get it, do it, and by the way, I'm testing you on it, and whether you pass it or not tells me whether you're a good or person or not. How's that feel? So put your mind now in the brain of a 13-year-old. So it doesn't mean that I'm going to pander to them. If a kid doesn't do the work at the end of the year, he's going to fail. But he will fail less. He will have more solid knowledge. What he has is firm, and we will have a solid base of data that we can say, okay, this stuff he knows how to do. I can then take the part that he doesn't know how to do that he never got to and take it to another teacher and say, work with these kids on just this. See, now I know what I'm dealing with, and I'm minimizing the amount of kids in the school that are doing that. You know, the majority of them are, are achieving. They're in the proximity range. And that small group of maybe 5, 10, 15 percent of kids in the school will have improved, and we just have more work to do with them, as opposed to taking roughly half of them, putting them on a checklist system, say, I'll see you at the end of the school year. Here's the test. Pass it or fail. And if you can't do it, well, I guess you're just not that smart. That's a terrible, I mean, that really is what's been happening for a very long time. For a very long time. It's just a terrible way to, I don't know of anybody that could function like that. I couldn't function like that. I couldn't. I was a slow learner when I was a kid. I was terrible at math. 